crime is difficult to believe. A husband and his wife, identified as John and Michelle Stevens, were enjoying a warm summer's night watching TV when cops say they were attacked by a madman. John and Michelle Stevens spent most nights in their garage, which they kept open so that they could talk to the neighbors who stopped by to say hello. They were killed, police say, by this 19-year-old frat boy, Austin Haroof. All right. I know I might look like a douche or a tool or I don't even know. But Police say when they got there, they found the suspect on top of John Stevens and he was biting the slain victim's face. Gather round, all you seekers of the night. Welcome to Patrick's Dark Corner. Hey, what's up everyone? Today I will be telling you about the cannibal frat boy. You know, the kid who took bath salts and ate someone's face? At least that's what I remember hearing when I first heard about this case in 2016. A lot has come to light since then, and there's so much more to this story. Austin Haroff was born December 20th, 1996 in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, to father Wade and mother Mina. Wade was a dentist who Austin described as a loud redneck who forced him to go fishing, which Austin didn't like. Others who know Wade describe him as a nice guy with a bit of a temper. So Austin and his dad did clash a bit, but nothing serious. Actually, Austin and his father became closer as Austin grew up. Today, we're going fishing. The mom, Mina, is described as very nice and very motherly. Austin and her had a great relationship. The parents actually separated when he was in third grade, so there was a lot of arguing and yelling and stuff like that. They eventually divorced and met other people. Austin also had a sister named Haley. He attended Suncoast High School, where he was on the football team, the wrestling team, and the weightlifting team attended Suncoast High and then FSU with Austin Harriff. He says Harriff was once a shy high school freshman. Early on in high school, very quiet kid. Um, maybe a little bit socially lacking. But Joseph says he saw the change as Harriff got involved in sports and his popularity grew. As he shifted and met kind of different types of people, maybe he wasn't prepared to handle that, um, that type of attention. He sometimes drank and smoked Mary Jane with friends. So really nothing odd or unusual about his childhood, nothing that would explain what's going to happen. In 2015, Austin enrolled in Florida State University seeking a degree in biology. He also joined a frat, which led him to party a lot. He went out several times a week partying and he drank a lot. Austin was a little bit shy and awkward, so drinking helped him with that. He didn't know his limits though. He would get blackout drunk a lot and he would wake up not knowing where he was or how he got there. He dabbled in drugs, trying Molly, LSD, mushrooms, Coke. He also would take Adderall and Vyvanse, which are ADHD medications, but he just took them so he could stay up all night studying because he liked the way they made him feel. He also started to smoke Mary Jane a lot more frequently. And because of all the partying, his grades slipped a bit. He still had like a 3.3 GPA. Halfway through the year, he changed his major to nutrition foreshadowing. In April of 2016, he began a relationship with this girl named Katie. On to summer of 2016, this is when Austin goes home to his mother's house for summer while school's out. This is when things take a turn. Austin starts a YouTube channel. How's it going, guys? Today, I'm going to be talking about fitness as a whole and the challenges it brings, okay? So, what I want to start off by saying is fitness as a whole. It's pretty tough, man. It's not easy, but nothing in life worth having is easy. Remember that, guys. You, you remember that? You remember that? <laughs> I remember. You got you, you to gotta make life hard for it to be good. That's, right. that's words of wisdom right there. 40% carbs. What? 30% um, fat, 30% protein. That, that, for me, worked the best. Uh, track your macros definitely tracking your macros is very important because you don't want to be eating 90% of your calories from carbs man 
You won't, you won't get muscle that way, bro. Mm -hmm. You just won't do it. Talk about what type of supplements you were on. When All right, I will. But, I mean, supplements to me don't really matter. Like, you take pre-workout, gives you energy, but I don't take that stuff because I don't like depending on it. If you want to, the best pre-workout, in my opinion, is probably coffee. Protein is important for anybody. Even if you... Even if you hardly work out, you still should take protein because with this American diet, you know, the Americans, they ain't eating that much protein, bruh. They only eating hamburgers and fat and, I mean, there's protein in hamburgers, man. It's, all, it's mostly fat. In July, Austin decided that he wanted to become a famous rapper under the stage name Austy Frosty with bops like this. I see this girl with a little friend. She's about 5'1. I say hi, hun. I Twist her around. Examine them buns. She headbutts me. Said, listen, I was just trying to have a little fun. I guess I'm on to the next one. Walked to the nearest church and made out with a nun. So this was really out of character for Austin, but he thought if he just worked hard enough, he could definitely make it as a rapper or maybe a pop star. I traded my how, I traded my how, I traded my how. Oh, oh, this ball. He became more fashionable and bought a gold chain. When he went to visit his girlfriend in Tampa in early August, she said he was just obsessed with his music and he would stay up all night working on it. She said he barely slept when he was there. And when he woke up, he would be screaming about demons, like in a sleep paralysis. After he left his girlfriend's house and went back home in early August, his focus started to shift away from rap and more into becoming the next Martin Luther King or Gandhi. He thought he could be a mediator to the Black Lives Matter movement, and he would fast like Gandhi and even have his phone lock screen be a picture of Gandhi. He became extra empathetic. He would give out food to homeless people and lecture his family and friends about being a good person. Oh, it's too hard. Oh, this is taking too long. I don't actually want it. You know what I'm saying? You just got to do it, you know? Like, life, it's the same thing in life. You just, you just have to be patient. He actually had a summer job at his dad's dental practice. And he would get into these deep conversations with the patients there, asking them about their problems and their personal life. Like there was this one patient who said that all of his friends died during the AIDS crisis. And Austin felt a special connection to this patient because they shared the same birthday. Yeah, he would just get really personal with these people who were just in to get their teeth checked. Austin would cry throughout the workday because he felt that he could feel the pain of these patients. During that summer, Austin also became more interested in religion and philosophy, which was, again, out of character for him because he didn't come from a very religious family or anything, and he had actually declared himself an atheist in high school. Still, though, he started researching Christianity, Krishna, Buddhism, and even the Illuminati. He started to wear all white and to walk in a way that Jesus was described as walking. He thought that he had superpowers, like that he could manipulate water. I'm not, I'm not a scientist, bro. But I know how stuff works. I mean, you can call me God if you want to. He also wore his grandma's old cross necklace for protection. And his friends would tease him about it because it was obviously a woman's necklace but he said that he needed it for protection from the devil. One time he actually got picked up in a Dodge Ram and the logo on the truck to him looked like a devil was staring at him. He started associating nighttime and darkness with evil, fearing that he and everyone in his house was at risk of being attacked by demons. He actually slept on the floor of his sister Haley's bedroom for a few nights. Um, he brought the family dog in for protection. He also started walking the dog, which was new for him, and he felt a special connection to dogs in general, but we'll come right back to that. Austin is a Sagittarius, and he started becoming interested 
in the centaurs that represented that sign. In fact, he started believing he was one, half human, half horse. He also started collecting people's business cards, thinking that he could protect them from evil that way. Then he would tear up the business cards because he thought they were attracting people. Evil. So just all kinds of crazy stuff going on. He also Googled, I think I'm going crazy. Am I going crazy? He sent a bunch of weird texts to his girlfriend. On August 12th, Austin flushed all the drugs that he had down the toilet, believing that they were evil. What's up, guys? I just want to let you know that I came to a realization of something. I no longer want to follow Arnold or any other bodybuilder. I want to follow myself, you know? I want to actually believe in myself. Not in, I want to learn from other things, other people, other bodybuilders and stuff, but I just know that they're not me, you know? I know what's right for me. I don't need drugs. I know that they can change me, but the thing is, that's not being healthy, you know? Being healthy is what's natural, you know? Who knows, you know? That same night, he went out to dinner with his dad and the dad's girlfriend. At the restaurant, Austin was just down in the water there because he believed it was the fountain of youth and it could make him live forever. His dad and even one of the waiters at the restaurant were trying to get Austin to drink an alcoholic drink to calm him down he refused to drink and eventually left the restaurant and went to his mom's house on the walk home he stopped to talk to homeless people and someone who was riding their bike swerved so that they wouldn't hit him Austin took this to mean that he had a force field protecting him he felt invincible on Sunday August 14th he went with his dad and his dad's girlfriend to a gun show at the gun show Austin bought a knife for protection he talked to a vendor about survivalism and talked to another one about tips on hand-to-hand -hand combat. That same day, Austin thought of eating a snake, thinking that it would protect him from evil, just like in Adam and Eve. Now on to Monday, August 15th, the day of the tragedy. That day, Austin was really feeling this special connection to dogs again, so he put on a Michael Vick jersey ago was throwing for touchdowns as the star quarterback for the Atlanta Falcons now has thrown himself before the mercy of a federal court admitting in court papers to dogfight. I don't get the logic there but let's continue. He went to the beach. At the beach he was on all fours. At some points he was jumping from rock to rock like a dog. When people were walking their dogs on the beach Austin felt this special connection to them. He thought he felt dog fur growing on his face and on his hand. After the beach, he went to his dad's house to pick up his car that he had left there. On the way there, he was running through the streets and again cars had to swerve to avoid hitting him and he took it as a sign that his force field was working well still. Once he was at the dad's house, Wade tried to give him... I tried to get him... Uh some volumes or sedatives. Whose volumes are those? Mine. Yours? Okay. okay. And uh, he gets, I, 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 I give him to him and he throws them on the floor. Mm -hmm. And he goes, I will not be controlled by you. So I went and grabbed the keys out of his hand. Mm -hmm. When was this? The, uh, I think Monday. Okay. And he's pissed off. And he jumps on the hood of my car and dents it. 
so I finally decided to give him his keys back so he didn't damage my car any further. Austin started driving to a jewelry shop and his dad was so worried about him that he followed Austin there. Once they were there, he tried again to give Austin a Xanax and Austin put it in his mouth, but then he spit it out. After that, Austin spent time with his mom, his sister Haley, and his friend Sam, and he told them all he was half human, half horse. Eventually, the mom went home, so Austin was just driving around his sister Haley and the friend. Austin was driving really erratically. As he was driving, Haley was texting the mom about how Austin needed to see a psychiatrist. The group then ran into a few of Austin's fraternity brothers who invited them to a house party that was going on. They went and a lot of the people there were drinking and smoking Mary Jane and they tried to get Austin to join, but he refused, although he did try to pour beer on his hand believing that he could absorb the alcohol through his hand. Austin was jumping around the party like a dog, and he would several times run into the backyard wooded area to be with nature. And the group left the party after about an hour and went to Austin's dad's house. On the way there, Austin rode in the trunk because as a dog, he felt that that's where he should be. Haley had been texting her dad about how crazy Austin had been acting. So the dad actually went home from work early to meet the group. The group then decided to go on a hike, and the father, Wade, said, We were walking through the woods for about two or three hours, and uh, uh, Austin would, would be happy, mm -hmm. and, he'd be, and he'd be quiet, and um, all of a sudden I saw, look, look, there's a poor tortoise shell that's, that's empty, mm -hmm. and there's another one. He goes, stop everybody. And he gets his knife, and it's about this long. Mm -hmm. And he says, stay behind me. I feel something going to happen here. I said, put that damn thing back up. What the hell is wrong with you? Mm -hmm. And he did. He then sprinted off. The group found Austin a distance away, but he was really dehydrated. So the dad, Wade, called his girlfriend, and the group decided to go to this restaurant called Duffy's to freshen up. Once they got to the restaurant, Austin said he had to go to the bathroom, but instead he left and went to his mother's house. I was at home earlier, at eight, seven, uh -huh. and he knocked on the door, uh -huh. um, and I open it, and he walks in, and he's just in his shorts and a sweaty mm -hmm. shirt, mm -hmm. going to the kitchen, Yeah, and because mm -hmm. I was cooking dinner, mm -hmm. I said, are you hungry? And he's like, yes. And I think I was in the refrigerator and I look over and he's got a, um, a not a jug, but a container of Western oil. And he's staring out the window and it's like, like he's about to drink it. Mm -hmm. And I just turned, I said, that's not a drink. And I grabbed it from him mm -hmm. and I put it on the counter. I said, that's Western oil. Mm -hmm. And he turned around and I don't know if the phone rang and Haley's calling me, but I, I mean, I do notice him getting a bowl and he gets mozzarella cheese and he puts a little bit of the oil in it and takes a couple of bites. Okay. And Haley's calling me, asking if Austin's there. Where was Haley? Where was she calling from? Duffy's. She was at Duffy's. And I said, yeah, what happened? And she's like, he, he left. So I'm like, awesome, why did you leave? He goes, I don't know. I said, come on, why did you leave? He goes, I didn't want to wait. Mm -hmm. I said, and then I said, well, is the food ready? And they're like, yes, have him come back and eat something. So I said, do you want to go back and eat something? And he's like, okay. The, the drive from your house to Duffy's, after he put on a, the white shorts and the blue shirt, did he say anything during that drive? Mm -hmm. or was it just No, I just, I said, you know, Austin, um, I'm worried about you. I don't know the exact words. It was just, I want to go to counseling take you to counseling maybe there's somebody outside that you know you can talk to if you're uncomfortable talking to us 
And I said, will you go? And he said, okay, I'll go. And he said it twice, I'll go. Once he was at the restaurant, he sat down with the group again, and his father grabbed him by his collar and said something along the lines of, what the hell is wrong with you? Austin pulled his arm back like he was going to punch his dad, but he didn't, and he instead stormed off again. The group tried to track Austin down, but they couldn't, so they called the mom, Mina, who then called 911. Police Department, launch your quarter, this is Chrissy. Um, yes, I need to, I don't know how to do this. My son, he's um, kind of taken off, and I'm concerned about his own safety. How old is he's he? acting a little strange. Um, 19. Does he, li does he live with you? Yes. Okay, what do you mean acting strange? Um, I, it seems like he's a little um, delusional or like he's acting like... That has, does he have a history of like that or anything? Recent, no, this is just like recent um, change. Mm -hmm. and that we're noticing um and he was out to dinner with his dad today and he took off and we just you know he was with his sister and he says you know he feels immortal and um like a superhero so i'm just i don't know what's going on with him do you know if he's been taking any drugs or anything like that nothing i've asked and mm -hmm. nothing recent right that uh, I know of. So did he leave the house or did he leave from the restaurant? Where is he, he last left seen? He the restaurant at Duffy's. What, which Duffy's is that? Um, by I-95. In what city, though? We dispatched for five. Uh, Jupiter, I'm sorry. Okay, hold on. You know, he wants to help everybody. He's, yeah, headed. Well, last scene was going towards Island Way, um, towards like going towards north, north of Church Street. Yeah. How long ago was this that he left? Yeah, I want to say 10 o'clock. It's not 9.30. And he left on foot? Nobody. Yes. He has no ID on him, His um, no phone. And where are you at, ma'am? Uh, I'm at home. Uh, I have, we'll say, I think the only thing he has on him is a pocket knife switchblade. And he's never done this before? I mean, this is like something new? No. This is just, I mean, his friends, I'm calling all his friends, and they're like, it's just, he's changed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is he white, black, or Hispanic male? Uh, he's white. He's got brownish brown hair, brown, light brown hair. Um, he's wearing white shorts, and he had a blue polo on, if he's wearing it. Uh, and a red hat. Make America great again. Okay. What's his name? Austin. All right. I'll get an officer by that can um, speak to you and um, see if they're going to put out a missing uh, person's alert or what they want to do with it. Um, do you have no idea where he might have went or anything? I have no clue. Okay. No clue. Does he have any weapons that own or anything like that that he would have on him or anything? Pocket knife or anything like that? Yes. Yeah, if he had a pocket knife, like a switchblade type pocket knife, I don't know. Okay. I, I think that's the only thing he has on him. Okay. Yeah, he doesn't own any other weapons. All right, I'll get somebody by there for you, okay? Great, thank you. He left the restaurant. Austin followed the stars and encountered an evil figure with a white face. So he went towards some white light for help. White light was coming from the garage of a couple, John Stevens uh, and Michelle Mishkan. Uh, the two had been together for 19 years. They were described by everyone as friendly and kind. They were known around the neighborhood for riding their golf cart around with their dog, Rebel, in the back. They were retired and just living their best life in Florida. On the night of August 15th of 2016, John and Michelle were just enjoying beers in their garage when Austin approached them. John and Michelle had a neighbor named Jeff who tried to go and help them after he saw Austin attacking the couple. Here's an interview with Jeff describing what happened. How far into the garage did you come? All right, here. Okay, and when you were running up, did you see anything? 
he was standing sort of like this. And not that I actually saw Michelle laying here, because I, I just knew that she was there from seeing that from over there. He was standing her and basically standing over the top of her at the time. Okay, so she was lying on the ground? Yes. Okay, then what, what was the next thing that happened? That's when I got to be right there, okay. he turned and looked at me and said, you want no part of this, you want no part of me, one of the two. And then from his right hand, swung, and I was standing kind of like this, and you know, whether I went to block or whatever, that's when he called me there the first time. Okay, with his fist? With his right hand, okay. um, and could only presume that there was a knife, not that I ever saw the knife, but presume that he had a knife in his right hand at that time, because that's the first hand that he swung, swung at me. Okay, were you cut here? Yeah, right okay. there, right there, and then several on my back. Okay, so he hit you with the, with his hand, and what did, what happened next? We then got into the little pitter patter fight thing. It's not like you know we were right. really truly really going toe to toe. You know, he was swinging, I was blocking, whatever the case may have been, because we're standing right here. Um, in the meantime, I was able to get a hold of his shirt, and when I yanked him, I yanked him like that. He lost his balance, and he went down to the ground right there, face first. And what? At that particular point in time was when I realized, because when I threw my head, I could see blood, and I saw blood on the ground, and started doing this, and said, my God, he's cut. Okay. So he was still laying on the ground, and then at that particular point in time was when I went back, because, okay. you know, there was a couch here. Right. There was the only way to get out of the garage at the time would have been to go through him or over him. Therefore, I let, the door was open, just like it is now. After escaping the scuffle, Jeff called 911. Fire rescue, what's your address? Young man beating up a woman across the street. Okay, are they outside or in a house? It's in a garage. Okay, can you tell if he has any weapons? Um, I think he had a knife, but I'm not positive. Okay, can you tell if she's injured or he's injured? Say again? Are, are either of them injured? Can you tell from where you are? Yes, there's a girl laying on the ground. He beat her up. I ran over there. I'm bleeding profusely here at the moment. Okay. I don't know what happened. All right, and can you tell stabbed. if she's conscious or is she unconscious? Say again? Can you tell if she's conscious? No, it does not appear so, no. Okay, and how? what kind of injuries do you have? Uh, I've been stabbed in the back. With a and, knife? Yes, I believe so. It was tough okay. to tell. Okay, you couldn't tell how long it was or anything? You need an ambulance? And yeah, we're quick, sending quick. them. We're sending them. And where is he? Is he yeah, I think in the he's area in the garage, still? Right okay. across the street from my house. All right. What's your name? Okay. All right, we're going to get the paramedics right out there. Sir, sir, what did the guy look like? Was he white, black, Hispanic? He is white. You know how old he is? About 25 years old. And what was he wearing? Um, shorts and a t-shirt. Do you know who he is? I have no idea. Does he live at that house, or? No, he does not. Did the female look familiar to you? Um, I believe it was the daughter of the house that lives over there. I'm not positive. Can you have your wife or, I don't want you moving if you've been stabbed, but I, can you have your wife or someone look out and see if he's still there? Um, I don't know. See if that car is still there, honey. He, it appears he's still there. And you, you said you, you definitely saw a knife and that's what he hit you with in the back? No, I did not see it. But my wife's looking in my back and it appears I got punctured. Yes, Dad. In the neck, in the head, three, three puncture wounds. Okay, we got units in route, okay? Okay. All right, just call us back if anything changes, all right? No, no, don't jump over there on me. All right, I'm bleeding pretty bad. So okay, we got, we got an ambulance and everybody in route. Just stay right there and stay calm, okay? Okay, thanks. All right, here's a police officer talking about what happened when they got there. I saw a huge, giant trail of blood, probably eight feet wide, six feet wide. I ran up the driveway. And 
Grace was standing right here, pointed a gun down to the ground. I saw a male lying on his back on an angle in front of the car, this 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 direction. And I saw another male on a what they call like a side mount grappling hold. He had his legs intertwined, his arm wrapped around the male, and he had his fingers like a fish hook in his mouth, pulling his face off, trying to pull his cheek apart. Was he saying anything? He was, he was ground. Okay. I pop him in the back. My countdown on my taser started at five, four, three, two. When it hit two, I realized it's not working. I yanked my cartridge off. I shocked myself. Ran back around Gracie okay. on this side. And then I kicked him in his head, trying to get him off of the mat. Let me stop and interrupt you. During this time that you were here, did you ever see Gracie um, utilize her phaser? No. She was, hold, she was at gunpoint. Okay. I kicked him in his head, head came off for a second, and he went right back in and took a deeper, deeper grapple hold. I started stomping on his head in that fashion, trying to get his head off the guy's neck, trying to get him off of him. Did you have similar boots on? Kind of, yes. Uh, the male was laying on the ground, and he said a couple of words, very calm, very soft, help me get him off. He said it probably two or three times. I didn't want Gracie taking a shot the way he was grappled up into him. There was no good shot. It would have went into him, into the victim. I kicked the male probably about six or seven times in the head, not boot kick but stomps on his head trying to get his head off. The Quest the Canine showed up. I don't remember if he came on that side or he came around. I believe he came up this way. Turned around, had him, the door pointed. He said, I'm gonna release the door. We're all yelling, get off of him, get off of him. He didn't get off, canine released the door. Suspect had his fingers in his mouth. The dog grabbed his arm, pulled it off. Suspect ripped it out of the dog's mouth and went in for a deeper hole. Canine pulled back, said again, releasing the dog. He released the dog a second time. Same thing. Grabbed his arm, pulled it back, and ripped it out of the dog's mouth again. I was here. Canine pulled off. I came in again. I gave him three or four more boot kicks to the head. At the same time, I pulled out my handcuffs. One more boot to the head. His head came off of his shoulder, and I was able to stop him now, where he banged his head against the concrete and stunned him. At that point, his arm came out, and I knew it got stunned. I smacked the cuff on his hand, grabbed it, and I yanked him and pulled him to here. Where his head was now this way, his feet were this way. I spun him over. Umbrella, I call him, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Grabbed his Is that your training? left arm. Yes, yeah, the training. Grabbed his left arm. We were able to put the second cuff on. He was pretty stocky, so he had to pull out his set of cuffs, so we had to use double cuffs on him. I backed off, holding the cuffs. I told the trainee, run in, check on her. He ran in, checked her, checked her pulse, and gave me a, a shake of the head no. He came back out, told dispatch a couple of times, get by a rescue in here, possibly two signal sevens. Then I told Umbrella to go get uh, shackles, and we shackled him. So, we, so he wouldn't fight. When I finally was able to separate him, he was yelling, I'm eating people, kill me. The kill suspect was screaming. Right? Screaming. And that's before he was handcuffed or as he was? As, as I was dragged, as I finally was pulling him off of him, he was screaming, kill me, I'm eating people, kill me. Very loud. 
and I was able to drag him over here. We were both able to secure him. I believe Tequesta even helped us secure him. Because there were two Tequesta cops, and one couldn't because he was holding K-9. The male victim was speaking when you first got here? The yes, victim was lying on the ground, just lethargic. Just, uh, and uh, I, I seen a slit from under his arm to his waist, seven, eight inches wide. I seen his ribs. I seen a huge hole on this side. And both both of them, the suspect and victim, were... Did you wide. see the suspect biting him at any yes. time? Yes. Sus the suspect, when I got here, like I said, was in, was in a full grapple, full grapple. And um, he had his, the suspect had his neck and head right here on the victim's neck, and he was chewing on his cheek, and I see big rips in his neck. Was he, was he just cheek. chewing, or was he like tearing like a dog, or? Tearing like a dog. Okay, okay. Well, I'm sorry, did you say he was tearing at him, tearing. or was he chewing at him? He, he had, a, he had a, a piece of his cheek, and he was, Trying, trying to rip it off like trying to rip a piece of meat. So the next day, this became a big nationwide story, and a lot of people were talking about Austin possibly being on bath salts, as just a few years earlier, a man in Miami had been on bath salts and eaten a man's face, so they thought that maybe this is what happened. So Austin's blood was taken and given to the FBI to be tested for drugs. After a few weeks, the shocking results came back, no evidence of bath salts or flocka. We were surprised by the results of the blood work. The test did show that Harif had an ethanol level of 0.17. There were also trace amounts of THC, the active ingredient in marijuana. So two independent mental evaluations were performed on Austin, and both of them diagnosed him as bipolar and as having a psychotic episode at the time of the incident. Both assessments found that he was legally insane because he did not know right from wrong at the time. Austin told the doctors that as he approached the garage, he heard a voice in his ears saying, I am evil, I am in control. He described the victims as just light and darkness and that he felt like a dog during the attack. He remembered calling out for God to save him. Austin has given a TV interview. Family members are watching this right now. What do you say to them? Look into the camera right now and if they're watching, what do you say to them? I'm sorry for their loss, and I hope that you can find it in your heart to forgive me, and I'm so sorry, and I never wanted this to happen, and <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's like a nightmare. Did you leave did you leave that restaurant wanting to hurt anyone? No. No. Why did you do it? I don't know. I don't know. If I knew I would tell you. Do you think you What? Do you think you're mentally ill? I guess so. I didn't know, though. The family of the victim spoke out, too, and they weren't buying Austin's tears. They said he was probably on drugs that weren't tested for, and he deserves the death penalty. At Austin Harif's hearing, family and friends of victims John Stevens and Michelle Mishkan unleashed their feelings on Austin. You are a disgusting human with a rancid soul. A sick animal that should have been put down a long time ago. You deserve nothing more than to feel despair and debilitating guilt for what you did every second of the day for the rest of your sad, meaningless, and pathetic life. I hope death comes for you sooner than later. And when it does, I will rejoice because only then will justice be truly served for John and Michelle. Thank you. I hope you burn in hell, along with your parents. Wade, you're disgusting. On November 28th of 2022, prosecutors decided 
not to prosecute Austin. So a judge found Austin Haroff not guilty by reason of insanity. He was sent to a secure mental facility where he remains today, but likely not forever. So what do you all think? Let me know in the comments. Personally, I understand the victim's family's anger, but at the same time, if this is not insanity, I don't know what is. Before I go, I wanted to thank everyone who has stayed subscribed as I restructure my channel. Thanks so much for watching. I will see you very soon. Bye. In the darkness, where secrets hide, there's a corner where the truth resides. Gather round, all you seekers of the night. Welcome to Patrick's Dark Corner, where things come to light. Patrick's Dark Corner.